And I both say good morning, good morning. I am sorry that I'm not with you in person, but at least Baruch Hashem, it is a great source to be with you virtually. We have an incredible, incredible daf ahead of us today. Today's daf is Ayin Aleph 71. And we are picking up Emirat Hashem on the bottom of Ayin Amad Bey's 70B. And we left off, um, we left off Amr Bichia. Amr Bichia, so literally again, last two lines of 70B. So remember again, we're in the midst of a very interesting dispute. The Mishnah seemed to indicate, not seemed to be, Mishnah said that the prohibition of ribis only applies between Jews. But if one is involved in a transaction without, with a non-Jew, then there is no prohibition of ribis. Yet Rav Nachman came along and said that one really shouldn't even charge ribis to a non-Jew. So we're trying to work through that a little bit and try to understand what's unfolding over here. No top of Ayin, Aleph 71a, Bichde Chayef. So this is very interesting. So, Reb Chiyabari Dravuna wants to make the following distinction, that halach lamaisa, when are you allowed to go ahead and charge interest for a non-Jew? To, for the amount of money that you need in order to sustain yourself. Look at the top Rashi on 71a, Bichdei Chayov, Hittiru lo, Biyosem ikan asrim dirabonon, Dilma asila misra. So we'll get to that last part in just a moment, but Reb Chiyabari Abba, Reb Chiyabari Dravuna, excuse me, wanted to make the following distinction, that essentially, one is allowed to charge interest to a non-Jew, up into the amount that one needs in order to be able to sustain themselves for their parnasa. But above and beyond that, I guess what we would call profit. Revach, so then one should not go ahead and charge interest even to a non-Jew. Ravina, Amr Ravina says, Hacha betamidi chachamim askinon. So Ravina says, no, two different cases. One is talking about charging ribbis. One is talking about where the lender is just a regular Jew. And one is talking about when he's a Talmud chacham. What's the distinction? This is incredible. Time of my goes Rabbanam. Why is it that the rabbis would say that you can't go ahead and charge interest to a non-Jew? In other words, like, if you think about it, it's counterintuitive. The, the fact that you can't charge interest in and of itself is fascinating and somewhat counterintuitive. The Yerakadosh Baruch Hu says when we lend money to each other, it has to be an act of chassad and not an act of, not an act of profit. So I understand Jew to Jew, but why would there be any kind of prohibition to charge interest to a non-Jew? What's the pshat with that? So this is incredible. So the Gemara says, Shema Yomo Mimasov. The concern is, that may be through enhanced interaction with the Jews. Since interest accrues, it prolongs the relationship between the lender and the borrower, and we are concerned, Chazal were concerned, that prolonged amount of time with the non-Jew in a relationship with the non-Jew, albeit a financial relationship, could have a negative impact on the Jew. So the Gemara said, the Chiba the Tamat Chacham, who therefore again, the rabbis normally said that for a regular person, you can charge interest to a non-Jew, because we're concerned that the prolonged financial relationship will lead to the Jew learning from the non-Jews habits and behaviors. But a Tamad Chacham, lo yomod mimaisav. But a Tamad Chacham, we're not concerned. Tamad Chacham is not going to learn from the behaviors of a non-Jew. And therefore, again, he is permitted to lend the non-Jew with interest. So very interesting this interest. So now, by the way, everything comes full circle. Why would the rabbi say that you can't lend the non-Jew interest? So now, with interest. So now I understand why. Interest prolongs the relationship between lender and borrower. We are concerned that when the borrower is a non-Jew, then halach lamaisa, the prolonged relationship, could lead to the Jew learning from the behaviors of the non-Jew. And therefore, we don't want that. Again, we have a concept. You know, so often in life, we think that we're not influenced by the things that happen around us. That we could, you know, be around people who speak a certain way, behave a certain way, but yet we can still maintain our own moral code of conduct. And while that is true to a certain degree, we are influenced by every single exposure. We are influenced by every single person with whom we keep company. And therefore, Chazal were concerned. Chazal understood that there has to be a distinction between Am Yisrael and the rest of the nations. So on one hand, we're obligated to be part of the world, and we're obligated to make a difference in the world, and we're obligated to have a positive impact, and to be Mekadish Yenshan, to sanctify the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But yet, we are also mandated to keep our distance. We're also mandated to ensure that the influences of the outside world do not seep into the collective nisham of Kalal Yisrael. Incredible Gemara. Ike demasni laha, excuse me. Ike demasni laha de Rafuna aha. Others brought down the statement of Rafuna on the following idea. The Tani Rav Yosef is a beautiful Gemara. Im kesef talva es ami. So the Pasik says, if you will lend money to my nation, es ha'ani imach to the poor person who was with you. So the Gemara says, what do we learn from here? So the Gemara is gonna dash in this entire Pasek. 
So part number one is if you will lend money to my nation. That's number one. As sa'ani imach, to the poor person who is with you. What does that mean? Ami benachri, ami kodim. So first of all, the Pasuk is coming to create a hierarchy in sedaka, in loans, in, in just financial care. So when I have a limited amount of resources and there's a need for the Jewish people and the nations of the world, the needs of the Jewish people come first. Ami benachri, if there's a choice between helping a Jew and a non-Jew, I have an obligation, a moral obligation to help the Jew first. Ani va'ashir, if... Again, in front of me, there's someone who needs a loan. One person is poor, one person is wealthy. Now, again, the wealthy person may also need the loan in order to help with his finances. Ani kodem. I give the loan to the ani or the tzedakah to the ani first. Aniyecha va'aniye ircha, aniyecha kodem. Let's say a person has poor relatives. And there's also a need in my community. There are poor people in my community. Who takes precedent? Your relatives takes precedence over, over other paupers. What happens if there are poor people in your city and poor people in another city? Coldman, excuse me. The paupers, the poor of your city, take precedence over the poor of any other city. Amar so Mara said, Ami v'nochri, ami kodem. So, again, we'll say, so before we get into this, it's actually very important because it's created a hierarchy. The, the context of the Pasuk is loans, but it's really created a hierarchy in terms of general tzedakah. So again, first I have an obligation to support Klaal Yisrael. After Klaal Yisrael, again, my relatives over anyone else. After my relatives, the poor of my city, my local poor, before anyone else after that. Incredible. So the Gemara says, so the first rush we made was that if there's a choice, right? They only have enough funds to help one person. There's a Jew and a non Jew, an obligation to, to take care of the Jew. The Gemara says, Pshita, is, is, isn't that obvious? The Gemara felt like this. Let's say I have a certain, a limited amount of money. I have the ability to make one loan. So in front of me, there's a Jew and there's a non Jew. But here's the difference. The non Jew is going to pay interest and the Jew is not. I might have thought that I would have the right to therefore give precedence to the non-Jew since it's a financial benefit to me. Kamash malon, no. Even in that case, I have to give precedence to the Jew. Incredible. Tanya. Om Rabbi Yossi. And I will say, you know, I think one of the interesting things is that we know that in Hilchos Tzedakah, there is a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy. So I, I think the way it often works in Tzedakah is that when a person makes themselves into a giver, then a person suddenly realizes that they have so much more to give than they ever realized before. You know, there's the famous Maeser, Rabbi Nachman, when he was a young child. I've mentioned this a number of times. Rabbi Nachman, he was a young child, so his mother would give him, we'll call it like a dollar. Obviously, it wasn't a dollar, whatever it was, a kopek, a ruble, whatever it was. Right? Give him a dollar. And he would, go, he would go to the pushka, he would get a hundred pennies. And he would give one penny at a time. And one, each and every penny, I'm, I'm going to follow the mitzvah tzedakah. One after the other after the other. Because Rabbi Nachman understood that there's a big difference between an act of giving a dollar versus an act of giving a hundred pennies. Even though quantitatively, at the end of the day, it's the same amount. But one is one act of giving and one is a hundred acts of giving. What's the distinction? One act of giving is a beautiful mitzvah but it doesn't necessarily make you into a giver. 100 acts of giving makes you into a giver. The more we give and the more we do and the more we habituate ourselves to becoming charitable people, again, obviously all of us, have, we have limited funds, we have limited abilities, but the goal is to condition yourself to become a giver, right? To give, to give, to give, to give, even if it's a little to a lot, but to condition yourself to give. Something amazing happens, that once I condition myself to become a giver, I recognize that I have a lot more to give than I had recognized or understood beforehand. Suddenly again, the hierarchies aren't as necessary because maybe there's actually enough to go around. And even the Gemara goes weiter. Tanya, I'm Rabbi Yossi. Rabbi Yossi says as follows. Bo re'eh samios enem shal malave beribis. See how blinded people who lend with interest are. They're literally blinded by their greed. Adam kor lechavir rasha, yoreit imo lechayev. You know, if Reuven calls Shimon a Rasha, so there's recourse for that. You know, st you know, we say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. That's not true. You call someone a Rasha, so there's recourse. So literally, Yoreit Imo L'chayev, Satosis has a discussion over here. Satosis quotes Rabbi Tzadik Goen, excuse me, 
who says that Allah is even allowed to destroy a person's property if they call you a Russia. So Tulsa says, I don't think that's correct. But on the most basic level, it could mean that you can go into financial competition with him. The point is there's recourse. You call someone a Russia, Reuven calls Shimon a Russia, Shimon has recourse against Reuven. That's how bad it is to call someone a Russia. The Gemara says, yet, yet, the Haim, Haim means those who lend with interest, Mevian Edim Velav Larva Kumos Vidayo. Yet, watch this, Reuven lends Shimon with interest. So here, what does Reuven do? He gets a soul for a scribe because he's got to write out the document. He buys parchment, he gets a quill, he gets ink. All of this money spent. And what happens? The Chosman and witnesses to sign Ploni Zek Kafra Belo And what does the document essentially say? That Ruvain, Ruvain has been a kofar. Literally, Ruvain goes ahead and negates the existence of God. So what the Gemara is pointing out over here, Rabbi Yossi is saying is the irony, right? If you call someone a Russia, that's a terrible trespass and there's recourse for that. Yet when someone lends interest, it's almost as if they're codifying and memorializing their rishos, their inappropriate behavior. They're literally taking the inappropriateness and they're putting it in a document and they're paying a sofa and they're getting a quill and an ink and an adim. And essentially, what does the shtar say? What, what does the document say? That Ruvain is a Russia. Why is he a Russia? Because he went ahead and he lent with interest. And in fact, he might take it even a step further. That when a person lends with interest, a person lends with interest, it's as if he denies the existence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, you'll ask yourself, why so severe? It's a, it's a pretty severe statement. I understand, you want to tell me you're not allowed to lend with interest? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says you can't lend with interest, that's all. Shem said you can't do it, you did it. That's an Avera, it's an Avera. But to say that if you lend with interest, it's as if you don't believe in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what's the Pshat? So remember, the Ribbon Shalom told us not to lend with interest. So whatever the reason is, or it's not, HaKadosh Baruch Hu told us not to do it. So if a Yid believes, that a Chalish Baruch Hu controls my finances, that a Chalish Baruch Hu controls my monetary success, that a Chalish Baruch Hu controls the outcome of my financial endeavor. So therefore, if Hashem tells me not to do something, not to lend with interest, I'm gonna listen because a Chalish Baruch Hu is in control anyway. So I might as well listen to him because he controls the outcome. And if I believe that he controls the outcome, then I know, I know that lending with interest, which is against the will of God, is not going to produce financial benefits. So yet, if a person nevertheless does so, so if a person knows, Kodesh Baruch Hu says, don't lend with interest, and yet I go and lend with interest, there's only one way to explain that behavior. I don't believe in Hashem. I know it's, 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 it's dramatic but I don't believe in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because again, if I did believe, then I would know that God controls my finances, God controls the financial outcome of my transactions, and if he tells me not to lend with interest, no benefit is going to come from lending with interest. So therefore, if I defy all of that, if I negate all of that, ignore all of that, there can only be one understanding, which is, I don't believe in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That deep down, deep down, I don't really believe in the Ribbono Shalom. Overwhelming, an over, overwhelming Gemara, which by the way, just in the positive way, just the hashkafa, the hashkafa of it, that really is such a beautiful idea that the Ribbono Shalom controls everything. And covered like the more we could instill that within ourselves, the better life becomes. So suddenly again, the business deals become a little bit less stressful, not totally unstressful, a little bit less stressful when I know that is the Ribbono Shal Olam in the driver's seat. And in general, life becomes, really does become a little bit stress, less stressful when you believe with all of your heart that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in control. If I believe that Hashem is in control and that He has my best interest in mind and that He loves me and that He's gonna take care of me, so suddenly again, there's a little bit of a load that's lifted off my shoulders and I can breathe a little bit easier. I don't know how things are gonna turn out. You're right, I don't know how things are gonna turn out. But I know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has my back. Incredible. Let's go back to Tanya. Rabbi Shimon Allah Omer, Komishiyesh Lama'os, Omalava Osam Shalobere. Let's listen to this. So now, we say this in the positive. Anyone who has money and lends it to another Yid without interest, Allah Bakasav Omer, about such a person, the Pasuk says, Kaspo lo Nasan Beneshach, he has not given his money with interest, Vishochad Anaki lo Lakach, he's never taken a bribe to tilt judgment against the innocent. O Se'ela, Lo yimot liolama. A person like this will never falter. Dadamal says in Tilma, dramatic pasuk, that a person who has money, lends without interest, will never falter forever. Incredible. Ayyadi Gimara says, Halamarata, Shekalamalve beribis, Nechasem mismotetin. 
So we'll say, so the idea over here is, remember, you see two things. Number one, you see that a person who doesn't lend with interest, the Kodesh Baruch is going to safeguard his financial interests. Number two, a person who does lend with interest, unfortunately, is going to see his assets diminish. I, the Gemara says, Vaha kachazina delo masi beribis, they come is motetid. But here's the problem. And this is always a problem with Gemara's like this. The Gemara says, what do you do with the fact that we see people who don't lend with interest? We see people who are honest, yet, with all of that honesty, with all of that integrity, they still suffer financially. So how do you explain that? How do you explain that, right? The Gemara is so beautiful. Don't lend with interest. Listen to the word of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and you're going to see success. Lend with interest and you're not going to see success. I frag the Gemara. There are so many people who don't lend with interest. So many good Jews. They do the right thing, yet they financially suffer. So how do you explain that? So the Gemara says, Amr Lazar, Halalom is spotted in Ba'olin, the halalom is spotted in the Olin. Everyone struggles financially. Right? The Gemara says that poverty is a galah miskagel, it's a wheel that turns. Everyone suffers financially at some point. The difference is like this honest people with financial integrity who don't lend with interest and abide by the word of God, they will rebound. They will rebound. But those ultimately, again, who choose to defy the word of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and do not subscribe to the financial morality of the Rebosh and the Torah. So when they struggle and when they fall, when they fail, they will not rebound. They will not rebound. So I will say, what, a, what, a, what, a, what an incredible, just, just the, the profound hashkafa in this, not just for loans, but for Yiddishkeit in general. What the Imar is essentially asking is, we see so many examples of people who do the right thing, and yet at the end of the day, they still suffer. Right? Sadiq Viralo, bad things happen to good people. So, so many people are careful not to lend with interest, yet despite all of that, they still suffer financially. So how do you explain that? Tushik Gemara says, right, they suffer, but they rebound. But they rebound, they come out on top. So what the Gemara is saying is like this, is that Yiddishkeit is all about the long game. And what we believe with all of our hearts and all of our soul is, is that if you do the right thing, at the end of the day, everything will work out. It may take time. Sometimes it's days, weeks, months, years, and sometimes it's generations. But at the end of the day, those who do the right thing, will always come out on top. Even if they suffer a decline now, at the end of the day, they will rebound. They will rebound, they will come back from these setbacks. And I will say, this is what gives us the chizik. This is what gives us the chizik in the contemporary situation in which we are, where, where we know we are on the side of right. We know we are on the side of good. Yet it hurts so much that when it feels like the world is against us, we take a deep breath, Bava Metziah, Ayin Aleph, Amud Aleph, Sometimes in life there are setbacks, but if you know you're doing the right thing, you will come out on top. It is true financially, it's true spiritually, and it's true morally and ethically. However, we hold the moral high ground. And even if we're pushed down a little bit, even if we're pushed down a little bit, at the end of the day, because we adhere to the Rebbe Shalom, because we maintain that moral high ground, we, Klal Yisrael, will come out on top. Tanya, Rabbi Omer, Rabbi says as follows. Rabbi says, get a little bit weiter over here. So, Ger Tzedek HaAmar Le'inyan Mechira, the Ger Tosh of HaAmar Le'inyan Rebis, Eni Yodea Mahum. So, Rabbi says the following. The Torah mentions a Ger Tzedek. Now, normally, Ger Tzedek means a convert, just a regular convert. So, it says Ger Tzedek by Mechira, by a Jew who sells themselves into servitude. And it says Ger Tosh Now, normally, Ger Tosh means a Gentile, who has essentially repudiated idolatry and observes the seven Noachite laws, the Shev Mitzvah B'nai Noach. So Rebbe says, it says Ger Tzedek by a person who sells himself as a slave. And it says Ger Toshav by Ribis. But in Yodea Mahu, I'm not sure what Ger Tzedek and what Ger Toshav means in these respective contexts. How so? So Ger Tzedek, Amr Le'inyan Mechira. So Ger Tzedek is written when it comes to a Jew who sells himself as a slave. The Chsiv, the Pasik says, V'chi Yamuch Achi Imach if your brother will become downtrodden, right? Your brother will become financially destitute. And he will be sold. In other words, we're talking about someone, a Jew who is sold as an Ebed a Jewish servant. So the Gemara says, Now, who does Lach mean? Lach means to the Ger. Shene'emar, Lager, Lager, to the Ger. So the Gemara says, It's not talking about a Ger Tzadek, Ela Lager Toshav. Rather, it's talking about a Ger Toshav, which we'll say, again, remember, is a non-Jew who has repudiated, repudiated idolatry and observes the seven Noachite laws. 
So Gemara says, Shenemar, Leger Toshav, Leger Toshav, Mishpachas Ger. What does Mishpachas Ger refer to? Zehan Nochri. This refers to a Gentile. Kishu Omer O Akar. And when it says ultimately La Akar, that refers Zehan Nimkar, the Avodas Kochavim Atzma. That refers to a Jew who is sold ultimately again, even to idolatry. Now Rashi points out over here, what does it mean a Jew who is sold to idolatry? It means a Jew who is sold to idolatry. In other words, he cuts the wood for the for the idolatrous service. In other words, he's, so he's not sold to the idol, but rather he's sold into servitude for the Avod Zara. So I will say, so amazingly enough, what we see is this possibility for a Jew to be sold as a servant, either again to the Ger, to the Ger Tzedek. Well, Ger Tzedek is a regular Jew. Ger Toshav, who's the Gentile, or maybe even again to the Nachri, to a non-Jew, or regular non-Jew, or maybe even to Avod Zara. So Mar Omar Mar, Velo Lecha Ela Leger, Shene Emar Leger, Lememra de Ger Kani Evedivri. Now, say, you're telling me now that a Ger, that a Ger is able to go ahead and acquire an Evedivri? So the Gemara says, Rumini, is that true? Now, both say, now here, Bepashtos, when we talk about a Ger, we even mean a convert, a regular convert. Is a convert able to acquire an Evedivri? After all, Rumini, Eina Ger Nikna Be Evedivri, Vein Isha Ve Ger Konen Evedivri. A Ger cannot be a convert, cannot be acquired as a Jewish servant nor can a woman nor a ger acquire a Jewish servant. So the Gemara says, Ger lo nikna be'evedivri. Why can't a ger be acquired as an evedivri? So the Gemara says, V'shav el mishpach to'o ba'inon. Because the Gemara says, it says that upon emancipation, the evid goes back to his family. The evid goes back to his family. And ultimately, again, the halakha, the ger doesn't have a family. Because we're assuming over here, right? Ger shen iskai kakadash no'odami. When a ger converts, He's a brand new person without without his prior family. As such, he doesn't have a family to go back to. So because of that, he's not acquired as an Eved. Furthermore, isha Viger Konan Evedivri, and neither a woman nor a Ger could acquire an Evedivri. Why not? Isha Lav Orach Ara. So we'll say by an Isha, we're concerned that ultimately again. It's inappropriate. Now, why is it inappropriate? Since a servant is there to serve you. So if a woman acquires an Eved Ivri, they're gonna end up being alone a lot of time together. And that could yield, or that can at least create the appearance of, of inappropriateness. Ger nami gemiri. So why can't the ger acquire an Eved Ivri? So the Gemara says, Ger nami gemiri, de makni kani, de lo makni lo kani. Because also we understand that he who can become an Eved Ivri, ultimately can acquire an Eved Ivri. But he who cannot become an Eved Ivri cannot acquire an Eved Ivri. Therefore, a Ger, a Ger, who cannot acquire an Eved Ivri, because remember again, I'm sorry, excuse me, a Ger who cannot become an Eved Ivri, because as we said, when you go free, you have to go back to your family. A Ger doesn't have a family. Therefore, Allah can't acquire an Eved Ivri. Very interesting, Allah. Amrav Nacham Rai Yitzchak. So, Eino Kona Vedino Ki Yisrael. Ava Kona Vedino Ki Nachri. So, Yimar says, no, no, no. A ger, when we say a ger can't acquire, when we say that a ger can't acquire an evidivri, what it means is he can't acquire an evidivri as a Jew would acquire an evidivri, but he does, can acquire an evidivri as a Gentile would acquire an evidivri. The Gemara says, what does that mean? The Sanyon, very interesting halacha. Hanirza v'nimkar l'nachri. We'll say if you have an evid who was nirza, nirza means his ear was pierced, right? He wanted to stay on past the seven years, or nimkar l'nachri, or for that matter, again, someone who was sold to a Gentile, so I'll say, so the halacha is that, interestingly enough, if you are a, a pierced Eved, or for that matter, again, an Eved who is sold to a Nochri, the halacha is that if the master dies, you did not get passed down to the children. Rather, again, you, you, you are emancipated. So like, therefore, again, we're suggesting that maybe a Ger essentially has the same halachos of Eved every purchase as a Gentile does. Okay. So we'll say, so we said before that neither a woman nor a ger have the ability to acquire an evid ivri. So Mar says, This must not be reflective of your of Rab Shim Gamil. What does Rab Shim Gamil say? A woman could acquire maid servants, but really cannot acquire a Jewish servant. Rab Shim Gamil Omer, Af Kones Ha'avadim. Rab Shim Gamil says, No, she could even acquire male servants. So obviously, Rishim Gamliel holds that a woman can acquire avodim. So what's going on over here? So Rishim Gamliel says, no, no, no. I feel that Rishim Gamliel will okashia can be eved ivri, can be eved kenani. So the Gemara suggests as follows: the distinction ultimately is one is talking about a case of where she is acquiring an eved ivri, and one is where she's acquiring an eved kenani, a Jewish servant versus a non-Jewish servant. Where lies the distinction? Eved ivri tsiniyale, tsiniyale. Eved kenani paritsle. 
an Eved Ivri, we're concerned that she may be tempted to do something inappropriate with the Eved Ivri. Why? Because the Eved Ivri is Tsanua. So therefore, even if she sins with him, even if they sin together, he's not going to say anything. The Eved Kenani has absolutely no problem running his mouth about his immoral exploits. And therefore, again, she's not going to sin with him because she doesn't want to suffer the embarrassment. So that's why the Gemara says she can't purchase an Eved Ivri because we're concerned that they may be tempted to sin together and they'll both have proper discretion, right? And that would tempt them to sin even more because they're going to keep the secret for each other. But Eved Kenani, you know, he's not going to keep any secrets. Therefore, she's not going to sin with him. Therefore, we have no problem with her buying one. We learned that an Amana, right, a widow should not raise a dog. Now, both sides. So this is an interesting halacha, which we have to discuss a little bit more, but the concern over here is, the concern over here is bestiality. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll clarify, hold on, hold on. We're gonna clarify this just, you know what? All right, we're gonna clarify that in just a moment. So the Gemara says as follows, but furthermore, she should not have a Tamil Chacham, a rabbinical student living in her home. Now, the Tamil Chacham living in her home is where concerned about impropriety. So Bishlo and Rav Tzniyala. So I understand why you don't want her to have a, 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 a Torah student living in her home. Why? Because they may be tempted to, to sin together, but they're both going to keep the secret, right? Because no one wants to be embarrassed. Ela Kalba, but when it comes to a dog, Kevan din Masrich Ba Mirsisa. Here's the difference. I guess the Gemara assumes that once a person commits an act of bestiality with the animal, the animal clings to the person a lot. So people are going to see that and they're going to be like, hmm, something happened over here. So therefore, she's not going to come to sin with the animal because Lamaisa, again, is she's going to be publicly shamed. They're both saying, the Gemara is highlighting the motif in general. People sin, as all of us, we all sin, as long as the sin can remain private. The moment that the Avera has the ability to become public, nine out of ten times, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it just because I don't want the public shaming of it. So therefore, to sin with a Talmud Chacham or a Torah student, she may be tempted to do so. They may be. It's not just her. They may be tempted to do so because they'll keep each other's secrets. But the dog, bestiality, if that happens, has to show them craziness. The dog's going to be following her around everywhere. People are going to say, hey, that's a little bit strange. I'm not even making any dog comments now. Amri in shimishum umsa de shanji de hu de misrach. The Gemara says, well, one second. The truth is, the dog will follow you around, not just for bestiality. Feed it, feed it, and it'll follow you. See, even if people see the dog following her around, they're not going to jump to the conclusion that there was bestiality of Yechas Shalom. But rather, again, they could just as easily suppose that she's been feeding the dog. So because she's feeding the dog, that's why it's following her everywhere. Incredible. Gert, so we'll say, so that's, that's the case of Gert Sedek by, that's the, that's the section of Gert Sedek by a person who sells himself as an Ebed Ivri. I, the Gemara says, Gert, Gert Toshav Amr Le'inyan Ribis Mahi. But what's the case of the Gert Toshav who's mentioned by Ribis? So the Pasuk says, when your brother will become downtrodden and he will extend his hand to you, hold on to him. Which means, we'll say, keep, right? The whole you saw the Chazaktabo means don't wait till someone falls down to pick them up, but rather when you see that someone's struggling, extend your hand and grab them there because it is so much easier to keep someone standing while they're still on their feet than picking them up once they've fallen down. So the Gemara says, which also teaches us how attentive and just sensitive we have to be to the struggles of each other. So the Gemara says, Ger Toshav, so, so, so to a Ger, right? A Ger Vitoshav, a Ger and a Toshav. And ultimately, again, they will live with you. Don't take from them interest. And you shall fear a Kaddish Baruch Hu. So the Gemara says, so therefore the Pasik says, right? So the Gemara says, that's the end of the Pasik. And your brother, your brother will, will live with you. And I both say, but here's what's interesting. What's interesting is it sounds like, right, the Pasik's saying that ultimately, again, if your brother is destitute and he's in trouble, go ahead, help him out, loan him money, and don't charge him interest. And who else is thrown into the Pasik? The Ger and the Toshav. Now the Pashtos, the Ger, is the convert, the Ger Tzadik, a Jew, a Jew. Toshav, the Pashtos means a Ger Toshav, who's a non-Jew. So it sounds like the Pasuk is saying you can't lend a non-Jew with interest. I says the Gemara or Minu, Lovin Mehen and Walavin Osam Beribis, the Chaim Begar Toshav. The Mishnah said, the Mishnah said, the Mishnah on 70B, top, top of 70B, the Mishnah said, you're allowed to lend a non-Jew with interest. So what's going on over here? 
To which the Gemara says, Amrav Nachem by Yitzchak, Miksiv al Tikach Me'itam. Does the Pasik say you shouldn't take interest from them? It doesn't say them plural. Rather, Me'itoksiv says, don't take interest from him. Who's the him? Mi Yisrael. Ultimately, again, from the Jew. So we'll say, essentially what the Pasik is saying is two, is two different things. The Pasik is saying that there's an obligation if you see someone in your midst, whether he's a Jew or whether he's a ger, a convert, or whether he's a toshav, a ger toshav, a Gentile who has repudiated idolatry and observes shemes and observes shemes as b'nei noach, if he's struggling, help him, help him. But the prohibition against interest, that only applies to another Jew. Right? That's, we'll say, that's atikach me'ito. Don't take, let's say don't take from them interest, don't take from him. Who's the him? Your fellow Jew. Don't take from your brother, from your brother, from the Jew interest. But you can go ahead and say, I know from base 71b, but you can become his guarantor. So the Gemara says, okay, what, what is this? So the Gemara says, uh, so the Gemara says, Leman. The Gemara says, I'm oh, sorry, Arev Leman. So we'll say, who, who are you becoming a guarantor for? So watch this. If ultimately, again, you're becoming a guarantor for a Jew, Vahatana, Elu Oven. So we'll say, so now, if you're telling me that a Jew, right, is borrowing with interest from another Jew, right, Ruben lends Shimon money on interest, and now I'm the guarantor for Shimon. So the Gemara says, here's the problem with that. And we're going to get to this in Mir Sashem. Here's the problem. Elu Oven below Sasa. We'll say, in, in an interest transaction, the following people are in violation. Malva the lender, Loba the borrower, Ha'arev the guarantor, Va'edim, and the witness is sign of the document. So I can't guarantee an interest bearing loan for another Jew. In other words, if Ruben lends Shimon money with interest, I can't guarantee that for Shimon because then I'm involved in the interest transaction that's prohibited. So what's, what's the case of me being a guarantor? Ella Lenachri. So we'll say, rather, this is very interesting. Rather, it must be that I'm guaranteeing an interest loan for a Gentile. The Chivan, the Dine, the Nachri, the Ozl Basar Arva, now, well, this is very interesting. So apparently, one of the ways, one of the ways in which Jewish law differs from non-Jewish law, at least in times of the Gemara, is that by us, a guarantor is only, you can only go to a guarantor after you've gone to the borrower and the borrower can't pay. Apparently, again, in Gentile law, at least in times of the Gemara, you could go, if you're the lender, you can go right to the guarantor. Essentially, the guarantor is in the same position as the borrower. So if I, as the lender, want to go to the guarantor and just totally sidestep and bypass the borrower, I have the ability to do so. Very interesting. Omer of Sheishas, what's the case? Shekibel alav ladun bedine Yisrael. No, the case over here, I'm sorry, let me read it. El Nachri. But here's the problem. If if we're talking about over here that there's a gentile, that there's a that there's a gentile lending, right, then Lamaisa, or for that matter, again, if I say differently, if I'm guaranteeing for the Gentile, right? So Ruben lent Gentile money, and I'm guaranteeing for Gentile, since in since in since in non-Jewish law, the lender has the ability to go right to the guarantor. So once again, I'm a party. To an, so essentially, I become like the borrower. If that's the case, then this is a ribis transaction between Jews. To which the Gemara says, Amrav Shei says, Shekibal alav lidom b'tine yisro. No, no, no. The case over here is where the parties agreed, ultimately again, to, uh, to, to deal with this loan in accordance with halacha. So the Gemara says, Ikibal alav lidom b'tine yisro, ribis nami lo One second. If you're talking about a transaction that is set up in accordance with halacha, then this shouldn't be ribis altogether. Right, Rebis is prohibited by halacha. So what's going on over here? Am Rav Sheisha shekibal alav lezu, fellow kibal alav lezu. So Rabbi said this is very interesting. To Rashi, this person, haniu deshakal Rebis, arev zeh halove me anachri vechozer vehilve li So I will say. So ultimately, again, so here's what's interesting. So apparently, they took upon themselves in this transaction to conduct themselves in accordance with halacha when it comes to not going to the guarantor first, right? So we're gonna go to the borrower first, not to the guarantor. When it came to interest, so that we were uh, going in accordance with the halachos of the general society, we're charging interest is permitted. I will say, you should just know it's interesting to see what is the Gemara essentially saying? That it's human nature to pick and choose. So we, right, we all do it. There are areas of Yiddishkeit in which I am proficient, in which I am diligent, in which I am responsible, and then there are other areas where I am just a train wreck. I, but I know what I have to do. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, 
consciously, subconsciously, we pick and choose. But say, you know, sometimes in life, not sometimes in life, all the time in life, Hashem Baruch never asks for perfection. He just asks for honesty. So as long as I'm honest and I say, you know what? I'm picking and choosing. See, what, what, often, what often ends up happening is when we pick and choose, I don't really want to admit that I'm picking and choosing. So instead, what do I do? Uh, I don't do this. You know what? It's, it's not my hashkafa, or it's, it's not my this, or I'm modern, I'm Haredi, I'm Sioni, I'm the Turi Karta, I don't know, whatever, 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 whatever like hashkafa I like to append it to my identity to justify not doing something. When instead, it's just so much easier to say, you know what? I'm not doing something. I'm actually not doing a lot of things. And the truth is not only that, I'm actually doing a lot of things wrong. I'm doing a lot of things right and well as well. I'm doing a lot of stuff wrong and there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm not doing at all. Just own it. Hashem says, okay, great. Great, thank you for the honesty. And as long as you're trying to be a little bit better each and every day, that's all that Kaddish Baruch Hu asks of us. But we spend so much time picking and choosing and then justifying why I'm not doing this. Instead, just own it. I'm not doing it. You know, I'm a human being, I'm frail, I'm imperfect. I'm trying to be better, but I'm not yet where I need to get to. That level of honesty, that level of honesty is all that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is looking for us, or looking, 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 looking to us for. That's all he's looking for. That, that sense of relationship honesty. If there's honesty, then I'm going to we can build forward. Let's go right there. So, Maldi Yisram Ha'osof Shal Nachri Medas HaNachri. So, let's do a little bit more. So, the Gemara says that the halacha is that a Jew is permitted to, now literally translated, a Jew is permitted to go ahead and lend the money of a Gentile with the knowledge or the consent of the Gentile, of the Nachri. So Gemara says, what's going on over here? Tan Malvi Yisrael ma'osof shal Nachri midas ha-Nachri, avalo midas Yisrael. A Jew can lend the money of a Nachri, of a Gentile, with interest, as long as it's with the knowledge of the Gentile, but can't do so in a similar transaction with the knowledge of a Jew. Gemara says, what are you talking about? Ketzad. Ketzad. Here we go. Very interesting case. So watch this. Ruvain borrowed money from the Nachri. Ruvain borrowed five thousand dollars from Nachri. Okay. Now what happens? Beribis. Beribis. So he borrowed five thousand dollars, and he's going to pay back. He's going to pay back. Uh, he's going to pay back Nachri six thousand dollars. Ubike shlach ziram. And now ultimately, again, Ruvain is getting ready to pay back the loan. And what happens? Matzu Yisrael acher va'amrlo tnemli vani ela lecha kiderach sheata malelo. So what happens? So Shimon comes along and Shimon says like this, hey Ruvain, I have a good idea. Give me the money, give me the money, and I'll give you whatever interest that you owe to Ruvain. In other words, so instead, instead of paying Ruvain back, you are gonna pay Ruvain back now, and therefore X amount of interest accrued. Instead, give me the money, I wanna use the money, and I'll take on the, the, the interest debt. So I'll, the interest is gonna keep on accruing. I'll go ahead, and I'll just give you the extra interest, and then you could pay back the complete debt, including the extra interest that I ran up, that I accrued, ultimately again to Nochri. The Gemara says, Asr, Asr, you are not allowed to do that. Now, Bosei Rashi says, why? Because Bosei, that's viewed, essentially, as Ruvain lending money to Shimon with ribis. The fact that Ruvain is going to take it afterwards and give it back to Nochri doesn't make a difference. At the end of the day, Ruvain is giving Shimon $6,000, right? Which was the amount, which was principal of $5,000, $1,000 of interest that Ruvain had accrued. Now, Shimon says, give it to me. Let me keep it for another year, and I'll give you back $7,000. The Gemara says, and again, even though it's clear, Ruvain is giving that money to Nochri. But at the end of the day, that's interest, and it's viewed as an interest loan from Ruvain to Shimon, and therefore it is Asr. However, again, if Ruvain introduces, if Ruvain introduces Shimon to Nachri, then it's Mutter. Then, then the transaction is going to be Mutter. Now, what's the Pshat? Rashi says over here, Mutter de Shluchohu. See, Rabbi say, here's what's interesting. But in the same transaction, right? So Nachri lent Ruvain $5,000. Ruben is obligated to pay back $6,000, $5,000 principal, $1,000 interest. He's about to go ahead and pay back. Shimon says, Ruben, give me the money and I'll pay for whatever additional interest accrues. So normally again, if this is just a transaction between Ruben and Shimon, it's absolutely Asr, it's ribis. If Ruben introduces Shimon to Nachri, oh, everything changes because now Ruben is simply, because Shimon has a relationship with Nachri, Therefore, Ruvain is viewed as the shaliach of Nachri. And therefore, again, there is no ribis issue over here. Fascinating. Now, both sides. Now, the opposite case is also interesting. V'chein, Nachri shalava ma'os mi Yisrael. What happens if Ruvain 
lent $5,000 to Nachri. Remember again, the aloha is you're allowed to charge interest to a non-Jew. So Ruben lends $5,000 to, to, to Nachri with the agreement that Nachri is going to pay him back $6,000. Okay, so what happens? So now Nachri is getting ready to pay back $6,000. So Matzi Yisrael Acher Shimon comes to Nachri and he says Nachri va'amrlo to namely vani ella v'chalki derech sheata ma'alelo and what happens? Shit. So now Shimon says to Nachri, Nachri, don't pay back Reuven. Give me, give me the money. Uh, give me the money. And again, whatever additional interest accrues, I'll give back to you, and you'll give it back to Reuven. What's the halacha? Mutter. Now we'll say this is mutter. Now remember, remember again, there are opposite cases. Why is this mutter? Because since Reuven and Shimon have no connection with each other, therefore again, this is considered to be an interest-bearing loan from Nachri to Shimon, which is totally permitted. However, But if Nachri says, great, sounds fantastic, let me introduce you to my lender, Reuven. And he introduces Shimon to Reuven, now it's over. Because now since Reuven and Shimon have a relationship, they met each other, then I will say the problem is this becomes an interest-bearing transaction between Jews. Incredible. So Bishlam is safe for the so I understand in the second case that it goes the Khumra, El Aresha, Kavan the Ain Shlichos the Nachri. But I will say in the Resha, there's no concept, we're gonna get into this, but there is no concept of Shlichos for a Nachri. In other words, we'll say Shlichos is a din by Jews. Is a din by Jews. There is no Shlichos by a non Jew. Ihu, sorry, Ihu, Nihu, Tekashako, Minerabisa. So because there's no Shlichos by a Nachri, so I don't understand. This should be, in other words, we'll say, even if you want to say in the, in the first case, right? In the, in, I should say in one one B or one one A, where Ruvain introduced Shimon to Nachri to the lender, so we said, oh, that's fine because it's just viewed as Ruvain being the shaliach of Nachri, and therefore when Shimon pays back the interest, he's really paying it back to Ruvain, who's the shaliach of the Nachri. So therefore, this is a transaction between a Jew and a non-Jew. One second. There's no shlichos for a nachri. Again, we'll see where this concept comes from, but the Mar suggesting there is no concept of shlichos. There's no agency by a Gentile. The concept of agency is between Jews. If there's no shlichos by a nachri, then this is a transaction between Reuven and Shimon, and it's a Rebbe's transaction. What's the case? So this is very interesting. Now, what's the case over here? The case over here, if we take a look, if we take a look at Rashi, Rashi says where the Amrlo Nachri the Yisor Rishon, that ultimately again the Nachri, the Nachri lender, says to the Jew, put the money down. So what happens? So what happens? So now, right, remember, Nachri lent Ruven five thousand dollars to be paid back six thousand dollars, principal plus interest. Ruven has the money. He's ready to pay it back to Nachri. Pay it back to Nachri. Shimon comes along. Give me the money, whatever additional interest accrues, I'll go ahead and I'll pay to you and you'll give it back to Nachri. The problem is, we're saying now, so originally we thought that, and now originally, again, assuming that Ruvain introduces Shimon to Nachri, we thought it should be fine because so Ruvain is then acting in the capacity of the shaliach, of the agent for Nachri. Now the Gemara says, but there's no shlichus by a Nachri. Now we don't know where that concept comes from. That's our next topic. There's no shlichus by a Nachri. So the Gemara says, so therefore it's between Ruvain and Shimon. So what happens? You're right. What's the case? Ruben is about to pay back Nachri. Shimon comes along, Shimon wants the money. What does Nachri say to Ruben? Nachri says, Ruben, fine, Ruben, put down the money. Just put it down, just put it down on the ground. And then Nachri says to Shimon, you take the money from here. To which the Gemara says, okay. So I will say, if, if, if that's what happened, then what is there to say? Essentially, if Ruben's ready to pay back Nachri, and Nachri says to Ruben, Ruben, put down the money. And then he says, Shimon, you take the money. So then this is a transaction between Nachri and Shimon. What's what's the problem over here? El Amra Papa Kigon Shinata Vinasan Biad. So I will say what's the case over here? The case over here ultimately again is when Rashi says Kigon Shinasa Vinasan A Nachri Biad, the Kiba Minarishon Minasan Mashani. The Nachri received it from Ruvain, received the payment from Ruvain and gave it to Shimon. The Gemara says, again, Ba'akati, my lememra. What is the problem with that? What's the problem with that? Maud what would you have thought? Nachri Gufei Ki Avid Adaiti Di Swalka Gamar Biyav. He might have thought about that maybe in that case, where ultimately, again, the Nachri receives the money back from Ruvain and then gives it to Shimon, you might have thought that maybe the Nachri is acting on the behalf of Ruvain. And that maybe, again, or maybe I dighted the Ruvain. In other words, not, not a shlichos idea, but that this is a loan that is still being done at the behest or on behalf of Ruvain. 
And maybe that should be also a problem of Rebis. Kamash Molon, no. Kamash Molon, I will say that we are not worried about that, that halacha lemaisa, again, whether it's a case where Reuben is putting the, pu- putting, the, putting the money down on the ground and Shimon is taking it or he's giving it to the Nachri and the Nachri says, I'll give it to, I'll give it to Shimon. Either way, once the Nachri is handling the money and Reuben essentially is out, it's not a Rebbe's problem, I will say. So therefore, what comes out over here is something really interesting. So therefore, what this really all hinges on is the Gemara. So, so when we were, let's go back. When we, were, when we were going through this case, we were operating with the idea that there is the ability for a Jew to be a shaliach for a non-Jew. That's why in the first case, where Ruvain, Ruvain the borrower introduces Nochri, the lender, to Shimon, the guy who wants to take the money now and build up the interest and then pay back the interest to Ruvain to go back to Nochri, we thought once Ruvain introduced them, they're fine because then it's clear that when Shimon pays back the interest to Ruvain, Ruvain is acting as the shaliach, ultimately again of Nochri. The Gemara now blew that up because the Gemara said, well, it doesn't work, it doesn't work because there's no shlichos for our nachri. So we'll say we'll stop over here for today, but our next topic is ultimately, again, what does that mean there's no shlichos for a nachri? Like what, 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 where does that, where does that concept come from? Where do we learn that from? Where does that come from? So we'll say, Mirat Hashem, that's our topic for, that's our topic for Erev Shabbos, for Friday. We'll say, I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person. Uh, a thank you to Amayish and to Jeremy for, for enabling me at least to be with you virtually. It's a great zuchos, even if I can't be there with you physically. I know that we are all joined at the Neshama. We all learn the same beautiful Torah together. We all learn the same daf, daf together. What a, what a daf it was. What an incredible daf it was. Such a zuchos to go through Ezu Neshach together. Again, physically distant, but spiritually united. Chevra wishing everyone a wonderful day.